Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for being here. My name is Emily Miller. I own and operate Colorado Burial Preserve, Natural Burial Ground in Colorado, and I'm on the board of the Green Burial Council. <clears throat> the Green Burial Council is a nonprofit organization. We offer a voluntary certification for funeral homes and cemeteries to uh, decrease the environmental footprint of our end of life practices and uh, discourage greenwashing in the industry. The other part of our mission is decreasing the environmental costs of our practices by increasing awareness in the general public for what our options are for end of life, what the impacts are for our end of life decisions, and what are some of the ways we can green our end of life arrangements. The Green Burial Council is a nonprofit organization. If you find the information tonight, we're going kind of going back to basics. What is Green Burial? If you find this uh, helpful tonight, I invite you all to consider making a donation and you can do that through our website and I will be dropping the link to the donation page in the chat here. Our presenter tonight is going to be Stephanie Driesen. Stephanie is also a board member for the Green Burial Council. She is an environmental professional with extensive experience in both climate policy and chemical management. During her career, Stephanie has worked to bridge the gap between science and applicable public policy through advocacy, education, and program implementation. She currently serves as a natural systems coordinator for the city of Kansas City, Missouri, implementing nature-based solutions to address climate change. Stephanie is also a lead green associate with the U.S. Building Council and holds an MS degree in energy policy and climate from Johns Hopkins University. She's also a BS in biochemistry and environmental studies from the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Stephanie has brought her expertise in sustainability, public policy, and chemical stewardship to her work with the Green Barrel Council and to advocate for environmentally just options for all. Uh, we are going to turn the webinar over to Stephanie here in just a moment. We will be saving time at the end for a question and answer period. So uh, if you have questions as we go through the presentation, please go ahead and type those questions in the chat. Everyone's muted just right now. We'll uh, have the option to unmute as we work through those questions when we get to the end of the prepared part of the presentation. So without further ado, we will turn it over to Stephanie with what is Green Burial? Okay. Um, can you hear me all right? Yeah. Perfect. Okay. Um, hello. As Emily said, my name is Stephanie Drazen. I currently sit on the board of directors and serve as board secretary for the Green Burial Council. Um, I've spent my career working in the environmental field, but only recently became aware of Green Burial during the pandemic. Um, and when we think of environmentalism and sustainability, death care might not be the first thing that comes to mind. We may think about conserving energy or water, maybe recycling or being less wasteful in general. However, all of that also applies to green burial. So in this talk, I'm going to go over some of the basics of green burial, what it is, why it is important, and how you can pursue a green burial option for yourself. During the talk, we're gonna go over conventional burial practices and some of the harm they can cause to the environment. We're then gonna go over sustainable burial practices in general before taking a deep dive into green burial specifically and the work we do at the Green Burial Council. At the end of the talk, like Emily said, there should be plenty of time for question and answers. So during the presentation, uh, please feel free to drop any questions you may have in the chat and we will go over as many as time allows. So uh, without further ado, let's talk a little about conventional burial practices. 
What we now consider conventional burial practices usually consist of embalming of the decedent, followed by burial in a casket, and the use of concrete grave liners or vaults. While other cultures have been embalming bodies for centuries, embalming didn't become standard practice in the United States until roughly 150 years ago. Before then, what we now think of as green burial was actually the norm. During the Civil War, many soldiers died on battlefields far away from their homes, but their families wanted to give them a proper burial. And the only way to transport these bodies long distances without them beginning to decompose was by embalming them. Then when Abraham Lincoln was embalmed upon his death, the practice really took root in America. Grave liners and vaults became popular during the rise of lawn style cemeteries as they make it easier to maintain a uniform appearance and don't require as much effort to backfill the soil as the body decomposes and the ground settles. Additionally, concrete vaults and grave liners helped to deter grave robbers during the 19th and early 20th centuries when grave robbing was more common. One caveat I'd like to point out is that many communities have continued to practice green burial throughout the last 150 years, particularly the Jewish and Muslim communities in the United States. So as you may or may not know, these conventional burial practices are very resource intensive. Embalming adds additional chemicals into the body to help preserve it. However, nothing ultimately lasts forever. And when the body and casket do eventually break down, these preservatives can leach into surrounding groundwater. Additionally, and perhaps even more egregious, is the use of concrete grave liners or vaults. These are meant to protect the grave from collapsing and make it easier for lawn style cemeteries to maintain a uniform appearance. However, concrete itself is incredibly resource intensive. It requires a large energy input to create and releases carbon dioxide when it is mixed, thus giving it a large carbon footprint. In fact, it is estimated that roughly four to eight percent of all carbon emissions come from concrete. This is in addition to the carbon footprint associated with the casket itself, which can be better or worse depending on where the material is sourced from and what materials are used. Lastly, I want to point out that I did attempt to find life cycle data to compare these different burial practices, but most of the available data is very anecdotal. This is something the Science and Research Advisory Panel at the Green Burial Council is working on, but it's also something that's needed to help further legitimize the field of green burial. So if there are any LCA experts in the audience, we need your help, and this is something that we are working on. So I know that was pretty fast, but hopefully that gives you a really quick overview of some of the environmental concerns surrounding conventional burial practices and why you might want to consider a more sustainable alternative. So we're now going to go over some of the sustainable burial practices that are available to us in the United States. On the left, we have a list of some of the sustainable burial practices available to us. But before I go into detail on those, I wanted to point out a handful of popular, albeit theoretical, sustainable burial practices that you may have seen in the news. So promotion or cryogenic freezing of a decedent um, has gotten popular in the news, but is not supported as physically possible by scientists. Uh, the Swedish company Promesa that was attempting this was actually liquidated in 2015 after failing to prove viability. Secondly, the mushroom suit pictured here is a burial garment inoculated with mycelium intended to neutralize toxins in the body, potentially speeding up the natural process of body decomposition and enhancing the available nutrient output. However, there were concerns in the conservation community regarding necessity, viability, and scientific support of the theory, and a failed field study ultimately resulted in the suit going out of production. Finally, and probably most popularly seen, is um, Capsula Mundi. It's that picture we've seen on the internet of a person in like a fetal position in an egg-shaped sack under a tree. However, that egg-shaped sack was actually created as an urn for cremated remains, not full body burial. It's made of biodegradable plastic and is meant to be interred in the ground and have a tree of your choosing planted over it. However, given what we know about the biodegradability and nutrient harvest capacity of cremated remains, the chances that a tree would grow to maturity over the capsule is highly unlikely. 
And while the urn is available on their website, there is no product available for full body burial at this time. So now we're gonna go into some actual sustainable burial practices. Um, this is that lift, list that was on the left. And these are roughly in order from least to most sustainable. The first of which is memorial reefs. In the case of memorial reefs, a decedent is cremated in a conventional crematory. And this is a good place to mention that some people consider cremation a greener alternative than conventional burial. However, I come from the energy sector and the amount of natural gas needed to operate a crematory kind of rules that out as a sustainable burial practice in my opinion. Additionally, mercury is emitted when a person with dental amalgam fillings is cremated along with other metals and filtration devices that can fully mitigate mercury pollution have not been invented yet. Furthermore, because of the density and non-biodegradable content of cremated remains, some green burial cemeteries actually don't allow cremain scattering. Cremated remains also consist of calcium phosphate and sodium, which are apt to smother foliage when scattered over the tops of plants. And buried cremated remains create what is essentially a nutrient deficit salt lick that has no environmental benefits and can cause girdling of trees and destruction of microbial communities. Above ground, this can produce phosphorus runoffs that create algae bloom in waterways, killing fish and plants. So while cremation is not an environmentally positive option, there are several things that can be done to attempt to offset the carbon footprint of cremation, such as recycling medical parts, making a contribution to a carbon fund, or supporting ocean reef regro regrowth, which is the case with memorial reefs. So once a decedent is cremated, their remains can be mixed into a nutrient-rich concrete slurry that is then molded into a reef ball like you see here in the picture. These are then cast into the sea and contribute to the artificial development and restoration of coral reefs along seaboards that have been damaged. So while cremation itself is not a sustainable burial practice, supporting the development and restoration of coral reefs is. This option has also become particularly popular for cremated remains of pets, just a fun fact. Secondly, we have burial at sea. This consists of scattering cremated remains into the ocean or consigning an entire corpse into the ocean. And as you might imagine, this is heavily regulated by the US Environmental Protection Agency and requires a number of permits and notifications. I've already gone over some of the issues with cremation, so I won't repeat that here, but for burial at sea, cremated remains must be scattered at least three miles offshore and full body corpses must be consigned at least three miles offshore and at least 600 feet deep. Different states and localities also have many of their own rules and regulations surrounding burial at sea. Once a decedent is cremated, there really isn't any sustainable practice associated with scattering the remains at sea, but if consigning an entire corpse, so long as the decedent is wrapped in something that's biodegradable, like a shroud or a pine box that is accessible to animals living on the ocean floor and can be used as a source of nutrients to surrounding wildlife as it decomposes, then it is a somewhat sustainable practice. Thirdly, we have funeral pyres or pyre as there's only one location in the United States that allows for open air cremation. And that is Crestone in Sawatch County, Colorado. Additionally, you might, oh, excuse me. Additionally, you must be, you must be a resident of Sawatch County to qualify. However, I've heard of people like moving there shortly before dying so that they could be buried by funeral pyre. Um, this burial practice consists of packing a half cord of wood beneath a pyre and placing the decedent covered only by a linen shroud on top. The decedent is then covered by strong smelling plants, usually juniper and cedar, to help dampen the smell. While this may be slightly more sustainable than traditional cremation due to the use of wood rather than natural gas, it still releases a lot of carbon into the air and is pretty resource intensive. However, funeral pyres have been used for centuries and many wish to be buried this way as a tribute to their ancestors. 
Next, we have natural organic reduction, otherwise known as human composting or terramation. This one has been in the news a lot lately. Long story short, it's exactly what it sounds like. It is a sped up decomposition that transforms human remains into a nutrient rich soil similar to compost. Here the decedent is placed in a vessel and covered with organic matter such as wood chips, alfalfa, or straw. The vessel is then lightly heated for about two months while microbes break down the body. Once the process is done, you are left with roughly one cubic yard of soil that the family can either have or can be used to restore forests or brownfield sites. All things considered, the amount of energy required is relatively low and the organic matter needed is pretty fast growing and readily renewable, making it a sustainable burial practice. Currently, it is only legal in Washington, Colorado, Vermont, Oregon, California, New York, and Nevada, but bills have been introduced in an additional 12 states in 2023 alone. Moving on, we have alkaline hydrolysis, also referred to as aquamation, resumation, or water cremation. In this process, the decedent is placed into a pressurized vessel to which a mixture of water and potassium hydroxide is added. The vessel is then heated under high pressure to rapidly dissolve the body in this highly alkaline water. After roughly four to 16 hours, depending on the heat and pressure, as well as the size of the decedent, you are left with bones and a nutrient rich water. The bones are usually crushed and returned to the family similar to cremated remains and the water can then be disposed of or used as fertilizer since it's actually so nutrient dense. As long as you have unlimited access to water, which admittedly is not the case for everyone everywhere, the real resource input is again energy. And if a renewable source of energy is used to heat the vessel, this process can be very sustainable. Um, it is currently legal in 21 states and bills have been introduced to legalize it in almost every other state this year. Finally, we have home funerals. Uh, this is less of a burial practice and more of a funeral practice, but I wanted to mention it. In all but seven states, you're not required to make use of a funeral director. And for many years before the modern funeral industry sprung up, people prepared their loved ones for burial at home. Um, again, many cultures and communities have continued to do this throughout the popularization of commercial funeral homes. And this can consist of bringing a decedent home from a nursing home or hospital, washing and dressing them, laying them out for vigil, hold, excuse me, holding a memorial service and transporting them to their final resting place. In conjunction with one of the sustainable, excuse me, sustainable burial practices I've mentioned, this can be a very meaningful death practice for the family of a deceased loved one. However, before deciding if this is right for you, I highly suggest reaching out to the National Home Funeral Alliance and checking to make sure you understand all the associated funeral laws and regulations in your state. Okay, so now for the main attraction, uh, we're gonna talk green burial itself. So what exactly is green burial? I have green in quotations here because it often gets used as like a blanket term across all environmental, mental, oh my goodness, environmental fields to signal something is environmentally friendly. For example, all of the sustainable burial practices we just covered could be considered green burial options. But officially the Green Burial Council defines green burial as a way of caring for our dead that furthers one or more environmental aims, such as conservation of natural resources, reduction of carbon emissions, preservation or restoration of habitat, and protection of worker health. While that definition could apply to many different disposition methods, the Green Burial Council uses the term to refer to burial of a decedent directly into the earth using only readily biodegradable covers such as a linen shroud or a pine box. This allows the microbes in the soil to slowly break down the body over time and make use of all the nutrients contained within. This form of green burial has been practiced by humans across the world for millennia and is the burial practice we at the Green Burial Council advocate for. Additionally, the Green Burial Council has laid out the following characteristics for green burial and green burial cemeteries. 
Green Burial forgoes toxic embalming, does away with vaults and grave liners, specifically chooses biodegradable containers such as caskets, linens, shrouds, and urns, discontinues the use of herbicides, pesticides, and fertilizers, and encourages sustainable management practices. Additionally, Green Burial may use GPS units or non-native stone markers to mark the grave sites. However, some cemeteries may just use coordinates or native plantings. Lastly, Green Burial may also support land conservation efforts, and I will go into more detail on that in the coming slides. With that definition, definition in mind, I'm going to introduce you to the Green Burial Council and some of the work we do to advocate for Green Burial. So the Green Burial Council was founded in 2005 by Joe Sehe to establish standards within the growing Green Burial movement. Similar to a LEED certified building or an Energy Star appliance, the Green Burial Council provides a certification for cemeteries, funeral homes, and products that offer Green Burial. We are affecting change by providing a realistic, verifiable, standards-based rating system so that the public has a reliable measure when making environmentally sensitive and responsible funeral choices. Unfortunately, as Emily mentioned, this is becoming increasingly important given the pervasiveness of greenwashing, which is the marketing of sustainable or green practices without the actions to actually back them up. This happens in the funeral industry when green package offerings include items such as embalming fluid that contain toxic chemicals, caskets from manufacturers whose environmental claims are not backed up by safety data sheets or life cycle analyses, and cemeteries claiming to offer green burial that won't accept shrouds and require the use of burial vaults. So by using a cemetery, funeral home, or product that has been certified by the Green Burial Council, consumers can be reassured that the organization has gone through a rigorous approval process and meets the green burial standards laid out by the Green Burial Council. So that might cause you to wonder, what are those standards and what is included in them? Like I said, the Green Burial Council certifies cemeteries, funeral homes, and products. Firstly, I'm going to go over the types of cemeteries we certify, which are hybrid, natural, and conservation. Each of these has a long list of requirements they must meet, but for brevity's sake, I'm just gonna go over the basics. If you are interested in knowing more about each of the requirements listed in our standards, they are all publicly available on our website, www.greenburialcouncil.org. So cemeteries. First, we have hybrid cemeteries. Hybrid cemeteries offer both conventional and green burial options. This usually consists of a conventional cemetery that offers the essential aspects, um, excuse me, the essential aspects of natural burial either throughout the cemetery or in a designated section. Hybrid cemeteries cannot require vaults and must allow for any kind of eco-friendly biodegradable burial container, such as shrouds and soft wood caskets. Secondly, we have natural burial grounds. These are cemeteries dedicated in full to sustainable practices and protocols that conserve energy and minimize waste. They do not allow the use of toxic chemicals, grave liners, vaults, markers made of non-native stone, or burial containers not made from normal, from normal or, or excuse me, natural or plant-derived materials. Natural burial grounds also go a step beyond and perform an ecological impact assessment that then informs where they bury decedents without disturbing the natural habitat. Finally, we have conservation burial grounds. These cemeteries are established in partnership with a conservation organization and include a conservation management plan that upholds best practices and provides perpetual protection of the land according to a legally binding conservation easement or deed restriction. They also make a commitment to conserve or restore a minimum of five acres of natural habitat. So in a nutshell, that is what is included in the Green Burial Council cemetery standards. Additionally, a list of all Green Burial Council certified cemeteries is available on our website by state. It looks like this and you can scroll through, find your state um, and see if there are any cemeteries in your region that are certified by us. 
Secondly, we have our funeral home certification. In order to be certified, a funeral home must define their must define in their general price list and publish on their website their green offerings. These must include the sanitation and temporary preservation of a decedent using only non-toxic biodegradable chemicals or simply basic cooling methods and the option of a private visitation without chemical embalming. They must also carry at least three Green Burial Council certified burial containers, accommodate families choosing to conduct home vigils prior to viewing on site without embalming, and offer sanitation and temporary preservation of a decedent using only non-invasive techniques and materials. I will go over exactly how to find this information at the end of the presentation. But again, all of the Green Burial Council certified funeral homes can be found on our website listed out by state. Finally, we have our product certification. This covers things such as caskets, urns, and shrouds. To be eligible for certification, a product must meet a number of rigorous criteria. All certified caskets, urns, and shrouds must be constructed from plant-derived, recycled plant-derived, natural, animal, or unfired earthen materials, including the shell, liner, and adornments. These materials must be reclaimed, recycled, or renewable, biodegradable under burial conditions, and harvested in an environmentally sustainable manner as certified by a third-party trust provider recognized by the Green Burial Council. All fasteners and handles, other than those made from brass or chrome, are excluded from this requirement. However, a product may not be approved if such hardware is deemed by the Green Burial Council as excessive or inefficiently used. Additionally, all finishes, adhesives, and dyes cannot release toxic byproducts within their manufacturing facility or through the expected processes of breakdown and disposal. Excuse me. They also cannot contain plastics, acrylics, or similar synthetic materials. And finally, greenhouse gas emissions produced by transportation of any of the materials to the manufacturing location or to the final um, consumer location must be offset through a recognized program. And again, a list of all the certified pro product providers are available on our website. So, if you or a loved one are interested in green burial, I would say the first place to go is our website. You can select the find GBC providers drop down from the header and choose if you want to search for cemeteries, funeral homes, or product providers. You're also able to search using an interactive map where you can zoom in on your location. Many cemeteries and funeral homes offer what is called pre-planning, where you can designate the type of burial you would like and create a plan with that funeral provider. In some cases, you can even prepay for these services. However, that's not necessary in order to have a green burial. You can simply communicate your desire for a green burial with your loved ones. Another option is to fill out an advanced directive, which is a document that allows you to spell out how you want your loved ones to handle your burial after you pass away. Additionally, if you cannot find a certified cemetery or funeral home near you, we recommend reaching out to your local cemetery or funeral home to see if they offer green burial options. Many places may offer these services and just aren't yet certified or may even be willing to work with you to provide green burial services. For example, my local cemetery in Wisconsin recently opened a green burial section of their cemetery. So the movement is definitely growing and it's always worth asking. And if you do find a provider offering these services, send them our way for certification. <laughs> okay, so before I wrap up, I just wanted to point out some of the Green Burial Council's upcoming offerings. We put out a bi-monthly newsletter that includes updates from the board of directors, information on upcoming events, newly certified cemeteries, funeral homes, and products, as well as a lot of other good stuff. And you can sign up at our website to receive those. We also offer two paid courses through our partner, Redesigning the End, on green funeral service and green burial cemetery operation, if you're interested in getting into the industry. As you all know, since you're attending this one, we offer quarterly public webinars on all topics related to green burial, 
and the next one will be held in February 2024, so keep an eye out for information on that. We will also occasionally post green burial advocacy and volunteer opportunities to our social media accounts at Green Burial Council on Instagram, Facebook, and LinkedIn. So make sure you're following us there. And we also are currently looking for a volunteer with grant writing experience. So if that is you, please fill out the volunteer interest form on our website. Finally, for more information on anything we cover today, um, all of it is available on our website. Again, www.greenburialcouncil.org. So thank you so much. This is my email, stephanie.drazen at greenburialcouncil.org. Please feel free to reach out to me with any questions if we don't get a chance to cover yours tonight in the Q&A. Um, but with that, I can now take some questions. And Emily, I don't know if you want me to stop sharing my screen or what's the best way to do that. I can just leave this up too. I think that looks fine to me. Okay. Um, there were two questions kind of um, uh, hinting around the same topic. Stephanie, you can take it or, or let me know if you want me to answer. Um, if someone has uh, died in a certain way, if they've had certain medications, is the circumstances of their death going to affect their choice or wish to have a green burial? Ooh. So I am not in the funeral industry per se. I'm in the environmental industry and Emily is, is in the funeral industry. I think the answer is no, but Emily, would you mind going into a little more detail on that? Yeah. You know, um, when we're alive and, you know, they give you chemo, it's like, oh, these drugs are so, powerful you have to be careful about you know who touches them and then who you touch and we're we're trained to think of them as as um really dangerous and, and in fact they can be but on the scale of all the things we put into the ground a small amount of chemotherapeutic residue still within the body or even if it's a, a residue of, of radiation treatment um, what they're finding when they've done studies of like what does a groundwater look like downhill from a cemetery, the answer is you have a lot of decomposing materials from the caskets, from the uh, uh, outer burial containers that Stephanie showed about. And the percentage of this stuff that might be pharmaceutical in origin is vanishingly small. And one reason for that is the soil itself is an incredibly good filtering, cleaning agent. And these same biological processes that break down the body break down. It's, it's all in the category of organic chemistry. And a lot of these, um, uh, yeah, type of residues are, are not going to be significant to this question of did we do an environmental good? So a cemetery uh, and a funeral home, we're, we're in the business of trying to help the people who've had a death. You can't turn them away because, you know, they had these medical treatments before their death, nor because they have uh, orthopedic joint replacements, hip replacements. When there's been a cremation, it's easy to remove all those uh, before the ashes are returned to the family. But when it's a natural burial, it's like, okay, our bodies are 95% or better biodegradable. We might have some of this metal in us or some of these chemical residues, but still the fact that we skipped all these other unnecessary chemicals and, and materials that, that also have a footprint when they decompose, um, it's still a net win for the environment to, to bury someone who's had chemo or implants or whatever it is. I'm just scrolling back up to look through the questions. <clears throat> oh, uh, there was one about our credentials. Um, so somebody asked, do we offer a certification for individuals the way we do for funeral homes and cemeteries? And the answer is no. The Green Burial Council's categories are only for companies, but we do offer an individual certificate of proficiency in both green funeral service and natural burial cemetery operations. So uh, I know the first question answer, uh, the first person who asked the question was, was specifically um, maybe coming from a death doula or home funeral. Um, 
background, I would think that that green funerals course is probably that certificate of proficiency is probably the closest thing that we would offer. And I would just caution you also to be very aware for people who are doing home funeral work or um, uh, funeral advocacy work, uh, some states will have certain actions that meet the legal definition of this is what a funeral director does. And uh, just because you've had a funeral your certificate of proficiency in natural death care doesn't necessarily mean you're going to meet those legal requirements in your state for certain actions if, if they happen to be regulated in your state. So um, just a disclaimer to uh, look out for that. And uh, I reminded myself of one of the other questions that I saw whiz by there. Um, so the Green Burial Council's website is a great, we have an interactive map and an alphabetical directory of the providers that have chosen to be certified with the GBC. But there is another um, list from Lee Webster is a prominent voice in the uh, Green Burial scene. And she's been an author of uh, books in our field and her website, the New Hampshire Funeral Resource Alliance. Uh, Lee compiles a list of every Green Burial Cemetery uh, whether or not they've taken the additional step of being GBC certified. So uh, there are some great resources on Lee Webster's website as well. Yeah, and I was I will add on to that a little bit. So I, I mentioned it was quick there at the end, but I mentioned as far as like the Green Burial Council offerings, the courses that Emily was talking about, um, the Green Funeral course and the Green Cemetery course, through redesigning the end are those two certifications that we offer um, for an individual or um, funeral providers, individual people. Um, but like Emily said, uh, that doesn't necessarily like, legally um, hold to that. Like you, you're now a funeral director, like no, there are different uh, legal requirements in every state that um, you would need to look into. These are more for information um, if you're interested in offering green funeral or green cemetery options and maybe are already a provider. Or um, I know we've had a couple people on our board um, who are not in the funeral industry take the courses just to learn more about it. Yeah, I took um, a very good practical information, even if it's not the same as a state license. It definitely, you could um, uh, I think it's been both helpful for uh, uh, funeral homes who want their staff to take the training, but then also people who are curious about doing this work themselves. Um, on this question of uh, kind of regulatory, uh, uh, there is a question from JM in the chat who's asking about the case that's been in the news recently out of Colorado about a, a disaster at a funeral home that was using the trade name Return to Nature. Um, and the question is, do you think these kinds of issues would dissuade folks from considering a natural burial? Um, the, 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 um, the story is a real tragedy. It's a really uh, upsetting thing that's what's happened to that community. But um, that funeral home was using the trade name Return to Nature without being uh, particularly green in its mission. Um, it never did align with the GBC. And in fact, what they're discovering is a lot of those peoples who were stored improperly, uh, they were seeking cremation. So uh, this is a problem, or it can be a problem with, with funeral homes in general. It's a problem of, of the funeral industry. And also just the fact that it's, um, that it is an industry, that a cremation and a, a mortuary is something that happens behind closed doors and you, uh, you know, take this leap of faith that uh, what you get back after a cremation is, is, is going to be what you're expecting. So uh, that's why I was saying kind of the real tragedy of the situation is actual natural death care, especially uh, a home funeral followed by a, a green burial where the family can be, you know, witnesses right to the final resting place. Um, if you have actual, an actual return to nature, uh, you know, the, there is no possibility of, of this type of tragedy occurring because the family retains so much uh, agency and involvement in the process. 
So uh, the sad part is now if you Google Colorado natural burial, you get these horror stories out of the, um, uh, you know, out of this investigation instead of the information about our GBC certified providers who are offering a true return to nature uh, uh, as a final arrangement. So that's where the mission of the GBC comes in. One of our, you know, bylines of our organization's mission is to teach the public about what natural death care really is, why you might want it, uh, why you might want to talk with your family about it. Um, and yeah, that, that uh, we, we just, uh, the good parts about natural death care are, are universal. They, they, they travel with us through history from ancient times. So they will continue to, to be there even as we have to kind of weather these sad and tragic news stories. So um, yeah, nothing to do but press on with the good work and also check for uh, the credentials of your funeral home, check the GBC website for if they've, you know, taken these voluntary actions to align themselves with uh, certification standards. Um, you can also check with your state's uh, it's usually part of either the Consumer Protections Department or the Department of Regulations, sometimes the Health Department, depends a little state by state, but um, they will have a, a desk whose job it is to field complaints and watch the licenses about your funeral and cemetery industry. Uh, so certainly you can do some research to um, protect yourself. And while you're doing research, I wanted to answer the question about um, caskets or containers. There was one that said, um, what I was are the preferred saying, materials? Penny and has a question. Is there a preferable casket material, felt, wicker, cardboard, wood, and a recommended online manufacturer? Yeah. So this is a great question because I think there's like a real scale of, you know, uh, what's the most environmentally friendly is not always going to be the best choice for the family in the circumstances. So there's like this a range of, of factors you might choose from. What is the footprint? What are the other features? Uh, what do we want? Um, uh, so I think that um, sort of if you start from the most the, the least footprint of what can you bury that's the most environmentally friendly, uh, minimal material, like only a fabric shroud is, um, uh, you know, it's going to be the least physical amount of stuff, virgin material that went into a burial. You could also make it not virgin material if it's a reused item, like how about a hand-me-down wool blanket or something like that. Um, Kind of one step up from that, you have uh, uh, caskets or containers that bury a little more of materials, but they are renewable. So I've seen containers made out of bamboo or seagrass. And so these are super fast growing materials that sequester carbon as they grow. And then, yeah, okay, we had to transport and bury a little more um uh stuff but hey we we sequestered some carbon too and we know that because it's only made of reeds or it's only made of bamboo it's going to go back to the soil really easy um for wood caskets i think there's a range too stephanie mentioned like a plain pine box so we're looking for something unfinished usually no interior or if there's an interior it too is biodegradable fabric um Burying a wood can a wood casket is more virgin material and and transportation and all of this. But I always think if you have a local artisan making them in your community, if it could be a uh, locally sourced lumber, if it could be reclaimed lumber, if uh, here in Colorado they sometimes use beetle killed lumber, meaning it's like a byproduct, it, it was dead already. Uh, something that's locally sourced like that would have a uniquely low footprint compared to you can also get a plain pine box that comes to us through the conventional cemetery, um, you know, the, the funeral home orders it from their regular supplier. That's still biodegradable. It has no finish. The handles are made of rope. The um, metal hardware has been replaced with wood carpentry, but it came to you on a truck. It sat in a warehouse under climate control. So the, the footprint of these different things vary. Um, for online source, we have a great uh, uh, 
per, source on the call joining us actually tonight. I recommend Passages International. Uh, uh, Darren is a board member with us on the GBC, but also the great thing about the um, line of shrouds and caskets from Passages is you can order them directly. They sell them directly to the public. You don't have to buy them through a funeral home. And in fact, it's federal law. If you have your own container, the funeral home has to accept it. They can't charge you an extra fee for handling it or anything like that. So uh, yeah, we recommend the Shrouds from Passages. They're GBC certified. Emily, there are a couple other questions that I wanted to get to real quick. Yeah. Um, do you work with Canadian cemeteries? So yes, we have a few cemeteries and I believe a few funeral homes. Um, that are certified in Canada, but definitely not as extensive as the United States. Um, but we, we do, um, if they're willing to submit to be certified. Um, sorry, I'm scrolling through the questions. Uh, we have a question from Babe. Is there a centralized database of green providers? Is this something the GBC would be interested in pursuing? I think we have the list of our providers that are certified through us, but like Emily was saying, and Emily, I don't know if you have the link to Lee Webster's site, if you could potentially drop it in the chat. She has kind of that big list that's beyond just the certified providers. Um, and we can kind of drop that into the chat, hopefully, um, and that might be a place to look. Um, I have one here. It says, generally speaking, how open are funeral homes to embracing green burials? Uh, that's a good question because it can definitely vary, uh, especially uh, it might depend on what we're asking for. So um, almost any funeral home has done a Jewish or an Islamic burial. Uh, they also are required to have what's called an immediate burial on their price list, which is a, a burial with no embalming or any other type of services. And if you add a biodegradable container, uh, um, a immediate burial can be a green burial. Um, but some of these funeral homes might have an objection if you start to say, and we want to have a viewing of my dad, you know, or, and we want him to be, uh, you know, prepared in a certain way, uh, you know, before he's placed in that container. Uh, funeral home, uh, embalming is never required by law, but some funeral homes will have individual policies that say, oh, you've just crossed the threshold where, because you want to do all that stuff, we want to inquire, uh, require embalming. So that's one of the reasons for GBC certification is we hold those funeral homes that elect to be aligned with us accountable to say, no, uh, your policies have to be that, you know, when appropriate, unembalmed viewing is is no threat to anybody. Uh, you know, it's uh, beneficial to the family and it can make for a very meaningful funeral. So um, yeah, the, the funeral home situation can be mixed and I definitely recommend to start with our website for that. <laughs> Another question, and Emily, you might know this better than me, curious to know the price comparison to conventional burials. From what I know, Emily might know ex better exact prices, but again, you're kind of doing less. You're not paying for a big fancy casket. You're not paying for the concrete vault. Um, so the cost generally is lower, more on par with like a cremation cost. Is that correct, Emily? You're absolutely right. I kind of said it like oh, the the funeral homes package for an immediate burial. It's kind of like their minimum thing is kind of similar to a green burial. If, if you aren't planning to use the chapel and their vehicles and, you know, all this other stuff that they can add on. So the details for how much a green burial will cost, it depends a lot on what is the final resting place. If you, you know, happen to live in a place where you can do this on a private property and the person dies at home and it's a home funeral, gosh, it's almost free. You only have to pay to file the death certificate and, you know, pick out the shroud. But most people are going to have uh, charges at the final resting place, the cemetery, on top of whatever the mortuary might be charging them. So in that way, a cremation 
I mean, sorry, a natural burial might be a little more costly than a cremation where you only have the one bill at the crematory and that kind of covers your mortuary needs and there is no cemetery charge. But um, certainly we would expect a natural burial to cost a lot less than a conventional burial because as you said, we're skipping the vault, we're skipping the casket. Um, uh, also, uh, depending, there was another question, how was a natural cemetery managed? This can vary a lot as well, but in the event that a natural burial ground is managed with a, sort of a hands-off nature preserve kind of approach, the cemetery is not irrigating, they don't have a mowing crew, so they're, you know, the ongoing maintenance fees are lower, or if it's the type of cemetery that you know doesn't have ongoing maintenance, they charge you one, one just once, we would expect that fee to be lower too. Um, so we got a couple of questions about public policies allowing for green burial in other countries and potentially even human composting in other countries, um, particularly Brazil, I think the, uh, the viewer is from. Um, so I kind of talked about this a little bit at the beginning, but like, at least in the United States, structurally for green burial, um, that's something that was done. I mean, we had to make laws to allow for embalming and to allow for conventional burial. Um, or what we now consider conventional burial. Um, green burial is, is legal everywhere, um, at least as far as the Green Burial Council does it with, you know, bearing directly into the ground. Um, so I can't really speak to Brazil, but that was not um, something that we had to like create policy for um, because it's the practice that's been done traditionally across the world. Um, as far as human composting, that uh, as far as I know, the the two or three organizations that are doing it currently are all U.S. based. Um, Emily, do you know anything about that going international? I dropped the link to the uh, Order of the Good Death. That's who would know is they have sort of a legislative advocacy hub for um, alkaline hydrolysis, body composting, sort of watching all these types of emerging issues. So um, uh, that is who I would follow and get in with their newsletter. And for those of you that do have a question about another country, um, if there is a you know place to have a sort of an international hub for advocacy to connect, I would think Order of the Good Death is, is a place to ask that question, yeah. <clears throat> Um, Claire asked about, uh, Stephanie said she'd be discussing green burial, re-land conservation in more detail. I think, Emily, you might have saw this one. How does long-term site management perpetuate within that framework? So the, the third category of certification with the Green Burial Council as far as cemeteries go is that conservation um, level cemetery. And that is usually done in partnership with like a land trust. Um, but it's in, done in partnership with an organization that protects the land in perpetuity through either like a deed restriction or an easement. Um, Emily, do you have anything to add on that one as far as how that can be then maintained over the long term? Yeah, part of the certification requires a baseline survey, uh, ec ecological impact survey. So our GBC certified sites are super varied. You know, they're all over the country and Canada and all different altitudes and amounts of precipitation and types of ecosystem. So what their goals are, you know, and for the ones that have this conservation easement, what, what that, um, you know, they're in this relationship with the greater conservation program, what their goals are for the management of the land, we allow a, um, uh, the, the provider retains their discretion on what those goals are, uh, what are the, are the processes and, and uh, procedures going to be to work for them. So, um, in general, we are encouraging them and requiring them to use practices that do no harm to you know, operational procedures that do no harm to their environment, sort of as their ecologist and as their study conceives of that question. So again, it, it just, um, it depends a lot on what the baseline status of the property is, what the history of the property is and what the future of it is too. <clears throat> So we're coming up on time. Um, 
I did see a question about the slides being shared um, or the presentation. So we have recorded the presentation and in the coming week or so, Ryan, our um, technical assistant, um, will be posting it to our YouTube page. And also there will be a link on our website to the recording um, of the presentation. Um, and we got one last question. Is there an ecological difference between the cremated remains from aquamation versus fire cremation? So aquamation is just going to be bones. There's not any kind of ash associated with that because it's not actually burning. Um, fire cremation is, my understanding is it's going to be more ash. Um, Emily, yeah. Do you have, yeah. You're right. So the alkaline hydrolysis cremains are usually whiter. They're more pure. The, they're a higher percent bone. Whereas uh, when it's been a fire cremation, you might have a mostly bone, but then also some soot. Uh, but in terms of the output of the process, the alkaline hydrolysis ashes or ashes are still going to be salty and high pH if you ask a plant. So they're both going to be in the same kind of problem for if we bury or scatter them, we might want to be thinking about how that uh, impacts where it falls. But you're you're right to point out that the output is is somewhat different as well. <clears throat> In the US, is it legal to do a green burial on your own land? Like if you have a farm or something, or does it have to be in a cemetery only? I it's not a US question. So this one's gonna go to state by state and sometimes even down to your municipality. If you're in a state where it's legal, your city might say no. So um, yeah, you always have to start with what jurisdiction am I talking about? And a lot of times land use laws are specifically municipal or county kind of level on what's legal. So best case scenario, absolutely, you can be uh, buried on your own private ranch, but in a lot of places, a natural burial cemetery or a hybrid cemetery section is the next best thing. Um, I, we, I think I answered this one, hopefully. Um, how involved is the certification for a funeral home? Without going into just extensive detail, the actual standard for funeral home certification from the Green Burial Council is posted to our website. Um, and you can literally look through line by line of like what we would require a funeral home to, to meet um, in order to be certified by us. It, it mostly centers around how they communicate their green burial offerings because we want their customers, that's you guys, to know, hey, natural burial is an option and we're not gonna give you guff when you ask about services with no embalming and we're gonna have accessibility to these biodegradable containers that you're about to need. So that's um, <clears throat> what we're asking them to be prepared about. So I think we're right about at time um, and I don't wanna keep anyone longer. Um, I'm gonna do the final pitch that Emily did at the beginning. So the Green Burial Council is a nonprofit um, and we're a volunteer organization. I'm a volunteer, Emily's a volunteer. Um, and without the support of sponsors or donations from you all, um, this event wouldn't be free. So if you found the information useful, please consider donating. There is a link in the chat and also any multiple links on our website, you can find it um, readily available. Um, and as I said, the actual presentation recording should be posted within the next week or so. Um, so please share widely with your friends and family. Um, you have my email. I shared it in the chat. Um, additionally, on our website, there's a contact page and an email. You can reach out to the Green Burial Council um, with any and all questions. Any, anything else to add, Emily, before we wrap up? No, this has been great. Thank you for putting it together, Stephanie. Yeah, thank you all for attending. All right, great. Thanks, everyone. We'll see you on the internet. Yeah. <laughs> okay.
Okay. We'll see you in uh for the next webinar. It, what yeah, is it? Two February. months. February 2024. Perfect. We'll see everybody in February. <clears throat>